Good morning. Um, it's really great today to have this conversation with my friend Kieran Bohan, who is the uh, coordinator of the Open Table Network. Um, Kieran, where are you joining us from this morning? Good morning and welcome to, to uh, uh, Open Table Network HQ in Liverpool. Uh, um, so, and this is my little corner of the office, which doubles as a studio when we're doing yeah. stuff like this. Yeah, so it's great. great to be with you. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for your time today as well. That's really, uh, really helpful. I'm, I'm joining in from Wolverhampton, which is my home uh, for the next five weeks. The, the countdown is on now to moving day. And um, uh, during during conference, when I was joining from online, um, one day a, a fan load of boxes arrived, which kind of made the point really that it's time to move. Um, but it's great to be in conversation with you this morning, Kieran. Um, I think we met first in January 2019, wasn't it, on a cold, wet weekend in Coventry, I seem to remember. Yes. Um, because we started out together on a journey of hope, which was um, uh, an ecumenical and multi-partnered um, pilgrimage of, for, for reconciliation, which was um, a huge blessing to all of us, wasn't it, who took part. Um, and, and we'll come so, back yeah. to that a, a bit later on in our conversation. Um, the, the, the genesis of this conversation was really born out of a conversation Q and I had uh, last weekend when it just so happened that we were both asked to be on different local radio stations talking about what was um, going to be coming up at the Methodist conference in this last week, which was the conference um, bringing resolutions to allow in principle for same sex marriage to happen within Methodist church premises and for um, Methodist um, ministers and other people who are authorised to preside over same-sex marriages as part of a whole suite of things that we're bringing to the conference, uh, not just about same-sex marriage, but all matters really about important matters about human relationships. Um, Kieran, I think you, you, you watched the conference online when we were having that, that debate um, yes, or saw some of it. Um, how did it, it how did it look from your perspective uh, for looking from the outside in as it were to that debate um it's fascinating it's clearly very carefully managed um so and because it's conference and because there's so many you know procedures around it then it was actually very mostly very calm and measured mm. um and and, and because of the sensitivity of the issues, you know, so when the vote was actually passed, it wasn't immediately clear what had happened. Mm -hmm. You know, because obviously, you know, it's not appropriate for there to be suddenly shouts of joy or, or, mm. or rage or whatever mm. from, from the conference floor. So it was a, a huge moment, but it was like, oh, what's happened now? And <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And, um, you know, I hadn't had the benefit of reading the many hundreds of pages of papers that had been prepared in advance. So as an observer, not being immersed in it, it was a little hard to interpret initially. Mm. Mm. Um, but clearly a really significant moment. And obviously the, the Methodist Church in its communication about it was very measured, mm. you know, res appropriately so and respectfully so, given the strength of feeling um, across the spectrum of views on this. Um, and I was a member of conference in 2019 when we passed the provisional legislation for this to be the case. Um, that we, we had very long conversations in conference, um, which, um, which were measured and there was a sense of grace and love and uh, for each other in, in the conversation that actually people were, were vulnerable and said things to the conference that, you know that they perhaps wouldn't ordinarily be very um, confident of saying in public, but they they said it with love and honesty that enabled us all to grasp actually, people's opinions and and how this matters to them. And that and in 2019 and again this Wednesday morning when we we voted on it, there was a there was a weightiness to it that actually was was to me very tangible. Mm. Um, that was like the that this was a really huge moment in the life of the church and not one to be taken um taken lightly but like you say it's almost like blinking you missed it because it was just so measured and um, there wasn't any great big neon sign saying this is the vote it was just resolution 59 slash whatever it was 
was voted on and passed and then we moved on and um, exactly I did, I did share that it was good that people did take the opportunity to notice that it was happening mm. outside of uh, mm. the British Methodism. Uh, mm. I think because it does, it does have potential impact for the wider church and wider society, uh, but mm. perhaps that's something we can reflect mm. on a bit more. Yeah, um, yeah. But, uh, but yes, I mean, given that, you know, churches move slowly and move you know, very methodically, no pun intended for Methodist <laughs> conference. Then, well, indeed, um, yeah, yeah. Then, to the uh, to the casual observer, it could seem like, well, what what was that, and what was all that fuss about, and mm. you know, has something just happened? I mm. Don't actually know for sure, mm. but clearly, it is really significant. And but it but as as Methodist communications team uh, reported it, that it's a decision in principle. Yeah. And so the work. The process and, and the work is not finished is it it's a that's right it's a yeah. decision in principle local congregations will still need to to reflect on the outworkings of this yes yes i mean yeah you know i've already had people say to me so so when can we when can we do this and it's well you know we need to just you know, just calm down a little bit and, and wait um be, because there is a process by which the methodist church has to engage with the general register <laughs> office so that we can we can say actually as a denomination we, we now want to do this and then like I say each local church each body of trustees has to have a have a conversation make a decision and go through a registration process themselves and um, as do those of us who are authorized people to conduct marriages we have to register for that as well and that will take a bit of time um although i i, I hope it's not too long because we need to get on with it now and get it done and it, so some people have said to me, well, it, you know, it's great, but it's not that great because it, there are still some churches that will choose not to. Um, and that, that, that is the case. But I think for, from, from my perspective, I think it's a really positive thing because as long as one Methodist church says yes, there is a Methodist church in which people who um, are in same-sex relationships can get married in that's a really positive step and you know over time that number will just in, I hope increase so that more and more places will be, will be able to offer that. Um, I think that's correct and I think that um, for the faith communities that have, have been on similar processes already you know freedom of conscience is absolutely essential to this you know because mm -hmm. the the people who people who've um, struggled with this process have, have been largely expressing fears that they will be forced mm -hmm. Uh, to go along with a change that they don't agree with mm. um, in whatever direction that change might mm. happen. Um, so we're hearing a lot of that in, in the Church of England. But so in the Open Table Network, we have uh, host churches in the Church of England and Church in Wales, but also in the United Reformed Church, Baptist Church and Methodist Church. Yeah. So the United Reformed and Baptist Churches have already had their versions of these conversations yeah, yeah um yeah. they didn't get as much attention as yeah. uh, the methodism and yeah. cfe have um and so urc and baptist churches can already make these decisions locally as can the quakers and the unitarians yeah. who were pioneers you know yeah. years before the rest of us got around to these yes. doing these conversations it, it wasn't well. even a question really was it i don't think for, for quakerism and uh not so much in Britain, yeah. I think yeah. maybe around the world it might be yeah. different. But yeah. uh, Quaker Quakers were pioneers. Mm. Unitarians, um, they're also a congregational model, so they they make decisions locally. So some Unitarians are have registered for civil partnerships and same-sex marriages. Some haven't. Some haven't. Mm. Um, same with Baptist tradition, you know. So some Baptist churches will be very strongly opposed, whereas others, mm. like Steve Chalk's Oasis Church. Um, uh, would be very pro. Mm. Um, so the Baptist church that's part of the Open Table Network is registered for same-sex marriages and the URC churches that are part of the Open Table Network are as mm. well. So mm. I think it is important that freedom of choice is respected so that we don't collude with those fears and stereotypes that, that are being put around that, that mm. people are going to be forced to do this. It's not true. Mm. Um, in the first same-sex marriages became legal in the Netherlands in, in 2001. So that's 20 yeah. years of legal precedent yes. around yeah. the world. Yeah. And I'm not aware of a single case of any 
faith uh, leader being forced mm. to conduct um, a same-sex marriage. Yeah. Uh, there's just no precedent for it. It's not based in in, in reality and law. Mm. Um, it's fear that that for the one side says, "Oh, well, you know, you're forcing us to do this, or yes. you're forcing us to do that." It's not true. Yeah. Um, I understand it. I understand where it's coming from, but it's not based in fact. Yeah. I, I think there's a protection in law that actually no one should be, um, you know, um, forced against their conscience to 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 do that. Indeed. Um, yeah. And, and I think it, yeah, it's, it's really interesting that the, the way we got to this point um, was, was about living together with contradictory convictions. Mm. And um, what the Methodist Church has or now says is that we understand marriage to be between one man and one woman and to be between two people. Mm. So we, we, we are holding those two things in tension and equal in our understanding of, of marriage, um, which, which I think is, a, is an interesting way of, of trying to hold this together, um, which makes room for all people to be, to be part of the church. Um, I think it was a really important part of the process. I think the other important part of the process is um, we, we also passed a resolution which um, was an apology uh, for the hurt that has been caused historically. And like you say, actually, sometimes things get buried in conference and we don't quite, you know, um, see them. But, but I think that's a huge step as well to say, actually, we recognise that in, in the past, there has been hurt caused and we are sorry for that. And I think each of us need to own that ourselves as well. That actually, uh, we may not have meant to cause harm, but, but actually in what we have said and done and or not done, we have caused harm and we need to reconcile for that as well. Indeed. I mean, that's something that, that we've taken inspiration from on the journey of hope. You know, the Coventry mm. Prayer of Reconciliation talks mm. about you know, acknowledging our complicity in the fractures mm. of the world. Um, yeah. That's a paraphrase. I'm not sure if it's an exact quote. I should know it by now. Um, <laughs> and and so, so, yes, true reconciliation involves truth uh, mm. about our own part in, in, in the hurts that, that um, mm. are caused and the harms that are done. And I think, yes, I think it's important to acknowledge that conference did more than just vote on marriage. Mm. So obviously there were important conversations around cohabiting and, and mm. you know, non-traditional, uh, you know, uh, adult yeah. consenting relationships that, yeah. that um, yeah. recognising the good in them and how they might yes. be steps towards greater commitment. Yeah. Um, the apology was really important. Um, yeah. We're sending a powerful message. But, but um, I believe there's also been a really um, important vote on conversion therapy. Can you t tell me more about that? Because I did. I, I, that's right. Yes. It's been widely reported. Yes. <laughs> and, and again, because the way that came to conference, it almost gets um, gets lost in the paperwork. Um, so that the Methodist conference works in a way that that our, cir our circuit and districts in the church can can send what's called a memorial to conference, which is asking conference to remember something. Um, and there was a memorial sent from our Birmingham district, um, which, which asked the, the conference to say that um, conversion therapy should be banned um, and to um, write to the government to that effect. And, and, and that, was, that was very convincingly passed as a conference. So we, we have said as a church that conversion therapy is banned in the church and it should be banned everywhere, um, which I think is, is another really important step in in our understanding of human relationships and what's appropriate. Well, conversion therapy has been much in the news, but there might be some folk um, who haven't understood the terminology. Yeah. Um, so, so conversion therapy, I mean, it's called therapy, mm. but there is no professional body um, in the Western world that accepts that, that it is possible to have therapeutic inventions to change one's mm. sexual orientation or gender identity. Mm. Um, there's a memorandum of, un of understanding put together by a number of British organisations mm. that was published in um, uh, in the, within the last five years, um, and the Church of England General Synod voted on it to, um, a few years ago and also wrote to the government. So mm. it's good that the Methodist Church is also in solidarity with that. Mm. The uh, Anglican Bishop of Manchester wrote, spoke about this in the last few weeks, saying it should be 
truthfully called conversion abuse mm. because calling it conversion therapy makes it sound medicalized and gives it some legitimacy that yeah, it actually exactly. doesn't have yeah, in, yeah. in any sort of ethical evidence. Mm. Like you say, calling it um, conversion abuse, you know, frames it in the way it should be framed. And we, we, we don't tolerate abuse anywhere else. So, so why should we tolerate it here? Um, Indeed. I think is is powerful. Yeah. And the other, the other resolution that was voted on that might have been missed um, that was about the use of um, non-binary, non-gendered language. Yes. Um, yeah. So I haven't seen much about that in the media. How how was that um, received at conference? Um, it was received very positively. Um, and and so to, to what we've said is that actually, uh, when we produce all of our material for conference in the future, when we're talking about changes to our governing documents. Uh, that refer to gender, we should use gender inclusive pronouns and language, um, which, which you know, um, was was one of those things that you could almost miss because it was done very quickly and very efficiently. Um, but again, it, it's it's a marker that says actually, um, we want to be this inclusive church um, mm. that 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 takes it seriously, and the way we take it seriously is embedding it in all of our practices and procedures um, and and that's aligned to another big piece of work that came to conference we don't have time to talk about now but um, we, we passed a strategy called justice dignity and solidarity which which has flown out of it of a very quick piece of work in terms of Methodist Methodism um, a, re a resolution was passed last year to say that we should look about how we become an inclusive church and that's been taken and developed and, and now it's a widespread policy called justice, dignity and solidarity, which is about a culture change in the church. It's about changing our culture to say, actually, our culture should be inclusion. Um, and where we find exclusion, we need to challenge it and, and to make it right. Um, and what we're looking for is, is a culture change similar to the culture change that we've had around safeguarding, that that is now just part of our culture. We, we don't need to... Um, think about it as consciously because it's just part of who we are and what we do and, and that's what we're hoping for with with justice dignity and solidarity um i'm really um, sorry so kieran you're you're leader of the open table network um that's been watching what the methodist church has been doing um with with um with this report that was called god in love unites us um how do you think it's perceived within your network and and outside of the methodist church do you think um, I think, uh, yes, as many people have been watching with great interest, I think in terms of the Open Table Network, so, you know, um, we've become a network. Um, we never intended to be so. It was started by a group of six people who wanted to come to some worship together um, as LGBT plus Christians um, because, you know, people had felt excluded mm. from church or, or feared exclusion from church so, um, and we called it open table which I believe was originally a Methodist theological term um, around ga gathering in that central aspect of hospitality of the Christian faith mm -hmm. you know Jesus last meal with his friends before he died and rose again you know it's a hugely um, symbolic and, and spiritual occasion which has been weaponized and used to exclude LGBT people mm -hmm. um, and we'd heard a number of stories of people in that very situation. So that's how we began and that's how we got the name. And that was 13 years ago um, in Liverpool. And for seven years, there was just us. And then people started saying, as they saw us growing and as they saw us getting support from the current Bishop of Liverpool, Paul Bays, um, mm. who's now a patron of the Open Table Network. And people started to notice and and, you know, so in 2015, suddenly we were talking to three other churches about how they might do it. Mm. And then we were a network. Mm. And, that, and, and here we are six years later, and we now have 18 communities um, across five different traditions. So Methodist, Baptist, mm. United Reformed, Church of England, Church in Wales. Um, so it blows my mind on a regular basis. We never intended to, to mm. do this. So that for me is evidence that the spirit is moving and it's not my kingdom I'm building because mine wouldn't be nowhere near as abundant and 
and uh, you know gracious. Mm. <laughs> um, but so this stuff is hugely important though because yeah. our you know we've heard lots of anecdotal evidence, but there's research conducted by others that show the impact of uh, the church's pastoral practices. You know. Um, so there was a, a huge survey of LGBT plus young people in 2016 said that 59% of them who were interested in joining a religious organization had stopped or reduced their involvement because of their sexuality or gender identity, mm. or rather because of the faith community's perceived reaction mm. to their faith, sexuality or gender identity. Mm. And Stonewall, the LGBT... So we did our own research recently, which just showed that, um, you know, being a member of a faith community, being an, being um, uh, LGBT plus was a, a barrier to being in a faith community for many of the people we're working with mm. and uh, other resident, um, other people's research bears that out. Mm. Um, and it's even more serious because the um, Steve Chalk's Oasis Foundation showed that members of the LGBT plus communities are significantly more likely to experience poor mental health Mm. Um, which relates explicitly to discriminatory pastoral practices of local churches. Mm. Um, and Jane Ozan's uh, foundation has shown that um, people rated their emotional and mental health significantly lower than the heterosexual peers, mm. um, especially if they'd undergone conversion therapy in an attempt to alter their sexual orientation or gender identity. So, mm that's the context in which these votes have been happening. Mm. Yeah. Um, and so people might see it in the media and say, oh, how interesting, or, or, um, or you know, about time, perhaps, you know, that, you know, mm. the laws changed several years ago, it's about time the church is caught up. Mm. Other people might be horrified. Um, but some of that fear and horror about this uh, as, uh, as a mark of progress might not, you know, um, I think that pales into insignificance when held up against the the, the, the negative impact of, of of the pastoral practices, which you know um, leave people in secrecy, in shame, or in in exclusion, and believing that the treatment that they've experienced um, through a flawed church is 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 their experience of God. Mm -hmm. So people do walk away um, as an act of self care and self love, perhaps because. Yeah it's healthier for them to walk away than to stay in what could be perceived as an abusive relationship with mm -hmm. church. Mm -hmm. um, I've had, you know, um, non-religious people say to me, why on earth do you stay? Mm -hmm. um, and it's not an easy connect, connect, um, question to answer in a way that convinces people who aren't uh, people of faith. Mm -hmm. um, but I think some of us are called to be part of uh, the change that we want to see mm -hmm. um you know with so some of us have, have experience of god which is bigger than the institution of the church and we feel called to be part of mm -hmm. that um one of the other patrons of the open table network is the scottish hymn writer and minister john bell mm -hmm. um and he inspired us when he he came out on the stage of green the green belt festival mm -hmm. in 2017 yeah and he ended his um speech with a really powerful call to action and he said those of us who know the love of god cannot stay silent mm -hmm. so yeah. we take huge inspiration from that and so that's why the open table network exists and does what it does that you know that we believe that god is bigger and better than this and the church is called to be bigger and better than this mm -hmm. that's that's really powerful isn't it and throughout this week i've been reflecting on that the people that, that i'm grateful for and you're one of them kieran and you know some really good friends of mine who've been part of this this journey um much more close than i've been the methodist church who've sort of kept my feet to the fire really on this that that actually um it, it's it's allowed me to know god's love deeper and broader than i would have otherwise i think because because you have stayed with it and you've not walked away and you've, you've constantly reminded me that God is bigger than, than I can imagine God to be. Um, and there is a broader vision that I need to, to um, glimpse some, something greater of God. Um, and so thank you for, for not walking away and being part of the church. Um, because 
it helps us all to to know God uh, deeper and broader and better, which which is just so powerful and life changing. Um, I think for 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 all of us, you know, I think we need to recognise that. No, I really appreciate that, Chris. I think one of the the things that I really reflected quite deeply on on the journey of hope mm. was that you know reconciliation starts with us mm. or rather let me rephrase that reconciliation starts with me mm. you know so if i'm uh, still holding on to hurt and anger to the point where i'm saying that those who don't agree with me are less human than i am or less whatever than i am mm. then that's part of the problem that's mm. you know where I'm complicit in the fractures yeah. of the world you know yeah. um it's yeah. very tempting um you know we all do it with you know by hu- by nature we're tribal as humans aren't we and you know mm. we we huddle together with people like ourselves for safety and identity and we can other those who are not in our group you know it's mm. basic human nature but we're, we're called to be redeemed mm. you know not and not to just stay as we are mm. in our basic human nature and, and we, we're called to be an us not a us and them it's about yes indeed exactly that and yeah. and and so i've did a huge amount of reflection while on the journey of hope and since to say well um how am i serving myself god anyone if i'm just saying oh you know look at those conservative christians look at those evangelicals mm. those pentecostals whoever they you know mm. it's you know insert insert you know the bogeyman or the the mm. enemy there you know um mm. if i'm kind of pointing the finger and saying you know i'm morally superior to them well how is that different from what they're doing to me it isn't mm. it doesn't serve any of us it just entrenches us in our positions yeah yeah and so therefore so i've got to start by working on myself and how i care for my hurt and anger um mm. and how i communicate respectfully but you know perhaps prophetically, perhaps in a challenging, mm. constructive way. Mm. Um, so that reconciliation is based on truth. I'm not shying away from the mm. truth that harm is, has been done. Mm. Mm. But, I'm not, but I'm not doing it in such a way that causes more harm. Mm. Yeah. It's really interesting that when, when the vote had been taken and the news was then that the vote had been carried, um, that in principle the Methodist Church would allow same-sex marriage, um, there wasn't there wasn't a, a, a great public sense of celebration, you know. The, the, practically, the work of conference carried on, uh, but when I when I told other people about the news, then it just didn't feel right to celebrate because actually I knew that 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 there are people in the church who who hold a different view from me and. And so I, I wanted to communicate that actually I, I'm pleased that this has happened, but at the same time, I, I want us to stay together and, and we need to find a way to keep <clears throat> having the conversation and keep reconciled and, and keep going on this journey to, together. You know, I don't want this to exclude you any more than other people have felt excluded in the past. And I, I think, I, I just reflect that that's a really powerful work of the Spirit of God, actually. Mm-hmm. That he's saying, actually, this is about the church being the church and staying together and, and continuing to walk through it because that's what churches should do. Um, so that's, it's bigger than just one vote, isn't it? You mm-hmm. know, freedom mm-hmm. of conscience or the decision in principle on, on, on marriage. Mm-hmm. It's, it's much bigger than that. This is an invitation to a deeper cultural change yes, um, yeah, yeah. in which we learn better to live with diversity mm. in all its forms. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, yeah. and so I think the Methodist church is um, perhaps blazing a trail, you know, others have gone before us in this, mm. but I think the Methodist church is doing it in a particular way that others can learn from. Um, mm. You know, the Church of England is not considering using more gender inclusive language. You know, um, I don't know if it's really going deep enough in 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 asking questions about challenging those binaries, which mm. say, you know, you're either this or that, you know, you're mm. in or you're out, you're them and you're us. You know, I think that um, 
it's not just about gender it's not just about sexuality it's about how we live with the diversity of humanity and how mm. humane we are to one another mm. absolutely yeah and um you know if if people haven't caught it yet then that the address of sonia hicks our new president who's elected at this conference was really all about that and it was about the, the table being open for all as you said earlier you know, that's the ethos of open table you know this was this this is fundamentally gospel the, the table is open for all people and we should always you know em, embrace that and be open with it uh, literally um it's, it's just a shame that all that happened when at a time when we couldn't be together and, and be open you know physically because of because of covid and lockdown restrictions and so on um Kieran, I'm really grateful for your time. I know you've got other things to go and get on with, but before you go, um, in um, October 2019, you and I were both in Glasgow for um, a gathering of reconcilers and peacemakers, and, and uh, that was the culmination of our pilgrimage uh, with Journey of Hope, and we were commissioned to be reconcilers in our churches and in, in the world. Um, it, it seems to me that actually um, that the vote that the Methodist Church, the Methodist Conference took this week, as momentous as it is, is, is a stage on a journey that we are still on. Um, what, what pointers would you say are important for us to, to continue that journey and it be a reconciling journey for the church um, as we... You know, there's been a lot of um, openness and grace and humility um, and courage shown in the, the last two years you know a process that was meant to go on for one year ended up going on for two because of the extraordinary circumstances we've lived through and it's a culmination of uh you know a process that's been going on since the early 90s and mm. so um i think maybe it's t uh, it will be helpful to have a, a time of your reflection think well you know look how far we've come how how well have we done this you know what mm. can we learn what can we hold on to to mm. sustain us uh, as we continue mm. you know we've got decisions in principle that need to be worked out in love um in communities locally and mm. to to acknowledge the freedom of conscience to engage or not to engage but to do so with grace and not with judgment of those who who think and act differently mm. yeah absolutely and i think you said earlier that you know reconciliation starts with me mm. um what, what is it that i need to to do to to be a reconciling presence in in in, in, well, in, in every space that we are in isn't it um it's, I, so. I think it's about how do i um uh, open the space for others to disagree with me and, and that not to be a defining point in our relationship but it's about we disagree but we can still be colleagues with friends because we are siblings in Christ that's Indeed. the important thing um, and you know there are lots of things we disagree on uh, and l let's not make this the the, the, the the bit that divides us you know there's a absolutely John Wesley, a uh, Methodist founder, preached a sermon called on, on the Catholic spirit. And he said, even though we cannot think alike, if our hearts are alike, it, give me your hand. Which is saying, actually, we don't all need to think alike. But if, if, if we can both proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord, then we can be together. And I think that's a really um, important thing that we need to hold on to 300 years after he said it. <laughs> Absolutely. That's a great inspiration. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Kieran I'm so grateful for your time um today but I'm I'm grateful for our friendship and I'm grateful for you as a sibling in Christ and I'm grateful for all the work that you're doing in Open Table um and I hope and pray for you that you will continue to challenge the church um to be a more inclusive place where all people can find God's grace at the Open Table um, you're an inspiration to me and many others and may you continue to be so so thank you so much for your time this morning Thank you, Chris. Goodbye. God bless.